You know, for many future veterinarians and zoologists, it can all start like this. But whether it's down on the farm, or down in the basement, or in the classroom, something strikes a spark in a youngster, turns his head, and inspires a career. Welcome to Anatomy of a Lesson. On today's program, we'll look at where scientists come from and the experiences that, for each of them, were life-changing epiphanies. Career counseling for future scientists, often when they least expect it. Today on Anatomy of a Lesson. If ever a profession was in need of a public relations makeover, it's that of the scientist. Throughout literature and in countless Hollywood productions, the scientist is usually portrayed as a diabolical creature whose white coat is a metaphor for madness. But real life science more than imitates art. What with birthing babies in test tubes and cloning experiments that put one sheep in its own clothing, public suspicion of what goes on behind closed laboratory doors is more than justified. But today, thanks to programs that are putting scientists in the classroom, the image of science is changing. And perhaps the perception of what it really does can't be far behind. And we found that this kind of interaction and, and uh, close going there, talking to the kids, showing the slides about the, the research that you do, but also talking one-to-one, -one, talking about your personal experiences, bringing them here, having them see your work and so forth, has had a really good um, impact. Their uh, attitudes uh, change we, throughout the year of those kids, but also they're very different from uh, the schools that we call the control schools, which are schools we test also, but we don't uh, offer the program. Um, and they have positive attitudes. In, in the case of drawing scientists, when, when you ask those kids to draw scientists again, we thought that, well, if we work, uh, they will draw us, like me and the other scientists that went. And that, that was the expected result and one of the responses we got. But the most exciting one was that they drew themselves or people like them. The legs may be too long or the head a tad too big, but these crayon masterpieces are more credible than they know. According to the National Science Foundation, there has been a slow but steady increase in the number of women and minorities participating in the scientific workplace. Despite the positive trends, however, there is still a long way to go. It was interesting for me growing up because I pursued my interest in science not as a black person, not as a woman, but simply as a person interested in science. Even when, after finishing my degree in science education and teaching in Philadelphia public schools, I went back to school pursuing earth science, I did not particularly meet any women or minority scientists as I was developing. Uh, late in my academic career, I did meet one woman professional. Most of the people who guided me at that time were white men, balding or not, and that's fine. But it has been a real enrichment for me as I've developed in my career to meet scientists of all colors, scientists of all abilities. Uh, when we look at the uh, diversifying science field, we don't want to leave out people with physical handicaps. Those folks also make great contributions to science. As we look at the data that we gather on sciences and people who are going into the sciences as professions, we do see some diversification, but it's still far too little. Even if the stereotype of the scientist as a balding white man is beginning to fade, public perception of what the new he or she is up to is still very skeptical. National Science Foundation figures show that only 40% of the population believes that scientific research benefits mankind. For the remainder, dispelling the notion of science as one big doomsday machine will take some doing. And even the ones that are, don't think that they're going to become scientists at least understand that what we do is valuable, which was uh, another goal we wanted. We don't want everybody to be a scientist, um, necessarily, just the ones that have the calling. But we want everybody else to understand that what we do has some merit and that we're not strange, pointy-headed people. <laughs> See, it has a whole lot of structure. I mean, you've got this retreat thing going on up here, and then these are the access lines that go down to this space, this dome underneath, that's kind of the catching area of the web. And then within that, if this was a mature web, there'd be 
dozens and dozens and dozens of very tightly stretched vertical lines with sticky silk right on the bottom. No matter how negative the polling data, for some people, science is simply irresistible. Their natural talents and inclinations only await that spark, that experience, that epiphany that starts them on the road to becoming biologists, chemists, geologists, and even Spider-Men. I like spiders because they do stuff. Um, I grew up in a, in a pretty rural setting in farm country in upstate New York, apple and uh, dairy country. And there weren't that many neighbors with kids really close to me. And uh, I spent my, my childhood wandering around in the woods. And so this, this fondness that I have for uh, looking at living things and studying what they do, studying is sort of a, a 50 cent word for it. I just like going out there and it's, to me it's like watching a video or watching a TV or something. What, what's this critter doing? Just watching a, a pill bug, you know, walk across the leaf and the way its little antennae go. Um, and, you know, when they turn around and why do they turn around and what are they going to do if there's another leaf in their way or, you know, or something like that is a fascinating thing. A similar fascination with creatures that are great but mostly small has turned a young Californian into an accomplished entomologist and a local hero. Armed with a menagerie of snakes and insects, including a new cricket species he discovered, 15-year-old James Fujita has turned some of nature's baddest critters into ambassadors of goodwill. The thing I do is I go to a lot of different schools and organizations and give presentations about insects and the other animals I have to um, you know, a variety of people. I've done a variety of age groups from um, kindergarten to adults. It makes me feel good when I see other people learning and having fun. You know, it makes me happy, you know, making other people happy. So it makes me happy that I taught them something as well as gave them some enjoyment. One of only six grand prize winners in the National Geographic Society's Kids Hall of Fame, James is already well on his way to his own scientific career. But because of his concern for his community and for other youngsters who also want to join a science dream team, James the Bugman is a term of endearment. Well, I would first like to thank my parents for supporting and nurturing my interest ever since I was a little kid. I'd also like to thank National Geographic World and Pizza Hut for, for inducting me into the Kids Hall of Fame. Uh, I feel I'm very fortunate to be awarded this great honor. I'd also like to encourage all the other young scientists out there to enter this contest because you could be up here next year you know, accepting this scholarship. For many scientists, epiphanies are only recognizable in retrospect. For Charles Darwin, it was a childhood collection of beetles that got him thinking about evolution. While for Thomas Edison, the light bulb went off, if you will, when he received a home chemistry set from his mother. I think that I've always been interested in science. My parents tell me stories about taking the furniture apart when I was very young, like three and four years old. I still remember taking apart telephones and clocks and then working to the stage where I could put them back together, which was very nice for them. And particularly as a teenager, working on the car with my dad, and I really learned a lot. That kind of interest led me to pursue a career in physics because physics address mechanics and energy and those kinds of things. And that's where I started my professional training in science. When I was uh, quite young, I'd say around 12, uh, I had an uncle who was a dairy farmer. And uh, he was uh, involved in uh, pure breeding Holstein cows. And I got very interested at that point in time in uh, what it took to build a dairy herd and how you would combine uh, animals for mating and uh, the sort of raising uh, animals toward a breed type. And so early on I was really interested in genetics sort of from that point of view, but I, I of course didn't have any mechanistic understanding of how those things took place. There are no dairy cows or disassembled furniture. But unforgettable experiences can be had nonetheless at a unique facility at Washington's National Zoo. The Amazonia Science Galleries give children a chance to participate in actual working labs, doing landmark research on subjects that range from the nutritional requirements of the desert tortoise to the genetic consequences of deforestation. 
and this test tube jungle could be the perfect launching pad for some future Nobel laureate who credits his career choice to the time he extracted salmon DNA at the National Zoo. Uh, I, I think one of the best things, especially for younger children, is actually being able to, to do something hands-on and to come to places like this where you know, they can actually touch things and handle things. And you know, we're here, too, as scientists, we're, we're accessible. So it, it's not a static display. You, know, it's, it's, you get a much better sense that people actually do things. They, they handle things. You can ask questions. You know, it, it's much more personal. And I think, uh, especially for, for younger kids in school, that, that hands-on uh, experience is what's really important because that allows them to really see themselves as uh, people who can do this as well if they're willing to uh, pursue a course of studies that would lead them in that direction. So it removes the, the barrier and the hierarchy to some extent uh, and, and kids can then see themselves doing something and that's really what we, we want to get across. For most students, spring break means outdoor sports, vacation, and one step closer to the end of school. But for thousands of students this year, spring's journey north has been the chance to follow the movement and the growth of some of the season's signature species on a website that have turned the entire country into a kind of victory garden. Sponsored by the Annenberg Group and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting's Math Science Coalition, Journey North brings together nature and computers as students across the country study wildlife migration and seasonal change in an online learning adventure. For an entire semester, youngsters in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico monitored the movement of creatures like manatees, monarch butterflies, and hooping cranes, as well as the emergence and growth of spring's most spectacular flower. Project Tulip had would-be gardeners all planting red emperor tulip bulbs in the fall and then starting on Groundhog Day, reporting via the internet when and how much growth had occurred. As data flowed in on the posies' progress, patterns began to emerge and questions were raised as students tried to fathom Mother Nature's landscape wisdom. So when the reporting began, um, the Journey North people said to us, what kind of a pattern do you see developing? And of course, both coasts bloomed first, and the middle of the country was empty. So we talked about the weather this winter, what had happened. We were able to bring that experience in, and um, the influence of the, the oceans on weather. And um, so I was able to build really lots of good math into it, lots of good science reading experiences. It, it helps them probe nature, ask good questions, questions that don't have just simple answers, but questions that lead them to investigations, to further discoveries. It leads them into a scientific way of thinking, and that's really the beauty of Journey North. They've become more accurate data gatherers. I noticed that they will compare their data with somebody else's, and then not so quick to erase theirs, but to say, you know, why is yours different? And I think that's the important thing to learn, is to be able to check your accuracy, but also to check your information. Journey North actually reaches in all directions, as the experience of springing forward via email puts every student in the backyard of the global village. By flying along with the monarch butterflies in cyberspace, as they make their epic migrations to Mexico, students could witness a species coping with a world of man-made obstacles. And they can ponder the important question of how will they make things better when it's their turn as custodians of planet Earth. And what the kids are telling us really, I think, is number one, that they're most interested in nature, in the environment. They're very concerned already at the third grade level and all the way up into middle school. They're very concerned about the environment they're going to be left to manage. Um, and so they're thinking very deeply, even when they're very young, about bigger questions. Journey North is just one way that websites are getting students to think about their environment and their careers. Others involve streams that often flow next to schools and the creatures that live in them, 
which are giving some students tangible and gruesome evidence that the world could use their help. In Minnesota recently, a group of school children and their teacher made an awful discovery that still has scientists scratching their heads. Deformed frogs, some with multiple legs, some with no legs, some with no eyes, have appeared in epidemic numbers throughout the state. To help determine the cause of the catastrophe, a first ever summit was convened in cyberspace as amphibian experts presented papers and exchanged ideas on the internet. If pollutants are eventually indicted as the cause of the deformities, then monitoring the safety of the entire nation's water supply becomes even more critical. At one high school in Southern Maryland, testing the waters is a highly visible project that has become more than just chemical analysis and public safety. Now the whole object of this uh, is, is that eventually we will have all our schools online, meaning that all the schools have a water test site at their school. And uh, their students will be brought to Frederick Douglass High School and will be trained here by our high school students. Now in order for our high school students to be able to mentor these other younger students, they have to be tested and trained by me and by other teachers here at the school. And they have to pass a test with a minimum score of 80% on water testing. And once those high school students learn to detect levels of dissolved oxygen, pH, and the other chemical nuances of a water sample, they get a title, a credential, and sometimes a lesson that plays for keeps. The kids are, you know, drilled and drilled and drilled, and they finally, uh, when they pass the test, they become what we call hydrotechnicians. And at that point, they actually get a business card with our website address, and uh, that has my email address. It has the logo for the water testing lab on it. So it makes them feel that they're, this is a business. And we're trying to show them that uh, science is just not in the classroom that it affects them every day of their lives, that uh, eventually when they leave here, that they could actually uh, get a job doing water testing. Well, what I've got out of the experience is patience with kids, and I learned that I can teach kids. And um, basically, I learned that I have, well, I thought I wanted to do something with computers, well, which I still want to do, but hydrotechnician is a second option. Back when I was like in maybe in elementary school, I used to be want to be a scientist. My friends, I used to tell them that, and um, and I, later on, I started to lose interest in it. But this has brought me back to it because I, I didn't think I had any edge in doing what I was doing. But this kind of showed me it wasn't as hard as it was, and especially it opened to my mind to what's going on around me. And um, it also gave me a skill that you sometimes don't necessarily necessarily get out of every class. With more and more opportunities for youngsters to sample science, many, like these, will be surprised to find it to their liking. And if these newfound interests are applauded and sustained, the steady increase in the number of science degrees awarded by U.S. colleges and universities may grow even larger. Each of today's scientists was once a youngster himself or herself. And whether they're tracking spiders, decoding DNA, were involved in some serious monkey business, all of them are on the horns of a dilemma. How to contain their excitement at being able to both help the planet and live out their childhood dreams. So a science career, just like any other, is a combination of native talent, a nurturing education, and a defining experience that can often happen just by chance. Now, as we've seen on today's program, you can never tell when or where or how such an epiphany will occur. But by providing students with plenty of enrichment, teachers can give serendipity a hand and create the kind of luck that can launch a career. Thanks for joining us today on Anatomy of a Lesson. You like that? <laughs>